Okay, thanks Ruby and thanks everyone for joining us today. My name's Susie and I work with the map collection here at the National Library. And now I'll just turn the camera off. So this webinar is being broadcasted from unceded Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. And it's a session all about sensing place in time. So it's particularly apt to honour the custodianship and knowledge of country held and shared by the region's first peoples, which benefits us all. Here's an overview of what I'll be covering with you today. First, I'll give you a sense of what's in the library's map collection. Then we'll run through a few different searches. And once we've located particular maps, I'll show you how to download digitised maps and how to request maps to use in the library's special collections reading room if you can make it to Canberra. Alternatively, how to order a copy of a map that isn't yet digitised through our Copies Direct service. Later on, we'll move on to finding aids, which are guides to collections. Similar to a book's table of contents, finding aids help you navigate a collection. They are a resource to find out where a particular part of a collection sits within it, and they provide rich contextual information about the collection. You may be familiar with finding aids for manuscript collections or the personal, generally unpublished papers of a person or organisation. In the last few years at the library, we've been creating finding aids for map formed or special collections. That's cartographic collections formed around the identity of the person or organisation that collected and or created them. The final part of the webinar will be showing you the library's exciting pilot georectifying service. This is a site which contains at the moment around 1000 of the library's historic parish maps for New South Wales and the ACT. We invite users to mark points on these historic maps and the corresponding points on current mapping so that the historical map can be overlaid on current mapping, showing changes in a place over time. So the general trajectory of this session, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, is moving beyond any confusing sandhill patterns to end up in the town of paradise. In other words, you finding the map you want. Before we move on, here's a quick note on scale. Scale is the relationship of the distance measured on the map and the distance on the ground of a place or object. It's expressed as a ratio. So the smaller the number, the smaller the area covered by the map, meaning a more detailed map. I've taken from Trove this handy guide to what is depicted at various scales. Look out for this when you search for maps in Trove. It'll be on the left of your search results and I'll point this out again later. The map at the top here is a map of Canberra at one to 25,000 scale, on which you can see Parliament House, for example. And below is a map of Australia at one to 10 million scale. So if you're, if you're after a map for bushwalking, for example, one to 25,000 or one to 50,000 would best suit your purposes. As you might expect, the library's collection at around 1 million maps and 1 million aerial photos is the most comprehensive map collection in the country. Here I've given just a taster of the types of cartographic materials held by the library. And there's quite a few I'm not showing here, such as rare atlases and maps dating from the late 1400s, uh, place-based board games, geological mapping, sales plans, and the list goes on and on. Different map types provide different information, perspectives, sense of place and time. I remember when I first started working in maps a couple of years ago, being struck by the length of a list of map call numbers. Running from A to S, subjects included maps for the blind, stick charts, maps of icebergs, religions and diseases. So really this webinar should be called Find the Maps You Want because looking at different types of mapping for one area gives you complementary layers of information and stories. And on that note, something to keep in mind is that although maps tell us a lot about their original purpose, for example, colonisation, there are multiple layers of meaning we can read, partly depending on the knowledge and experience of a place we bring to the table. And there will be some links coming to you after the webinar today that speak to decolonizing historic maps, if that's something you'd like to explore. 
To comment on just a few of the maps represented here, on top left we have topographic maps, um, which show physical features like contours, waterways and roads. This type of mapping is often prompted by military and mining activities. In Australia, it's usually government bodies publishing these maps. The library has topographic mapping for all parts of the world as well as Australia. And a common scale is one to 100,000 or regional scale for this type of mapping. So that means one centimetre on the map represents one kilometre on the ground. Moving to the bottom left here, we have parish maps, which were used by lands departments to register all land holdings, to show boundaries, land use and types of ownership on a European context. So they show the size and position of properties and other useful geographical information. Top right here, we have a stock route or pastoral map, which can be particularly interesting in intertwined histories of Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia. So stories of labour, resources, movement and environmental impact. At the moment, over 100,000 of the library's maps are available for high resolution download and more maps are being digitised every day, with a particular focus at the moment on Australian series mapping. So there's plenty to explore and I'll show you later on how to download digitised maps. First up, I'm going to show you some ways to search for maps using the library's catalogue. Here's the address and I'll click through now. To find maps, you generally need two things, a location, and if you know the type of map or theme you want, you can include that too. So for example, topographic or a scale. Let's start with a basic search. My example is Papua. So it's as simple as typing that in, limiting to map over here and hitting find. So some things to note are that you can sort your results here. And I'm going to sort by date, oldest to newest. In your search results, you have a handy visual guide as to what's been digitised with the thumbnails here. And you can also see that there's an icon indicating what's online. On the right are options to narrow your search. So just to mention some of them, you can see format with one result, microform, the rest all maps. Um, e-resources indicating online content, subject areas, uh, series, meaning a number of map sheets covering a large area using the same coordinate system, the decade, language, um, which here you can see shows some relevant colonial powers, and geographic. So for this example, I'm going to go to subject area, and I'm going to extend the list by clicking on more. And I'm going to select nautical charts, Papua New Guinea. From here, I'm going to click on the third result, German, German nautical charts. And nautical charts are also called hydrographic charts. They're produced by navies. So looking at some things that the record tells us, um, we can see the size of the maps here see notes and scrolling down we can see there's information about copyright. So once we click on that tab we can see that these maps are out of copyright because they were published before 1955. As we did when we narrowed the search in this record we can click on subjects which are useful for finding related materials for example. Um, so here's what's returned if I click on Germany colonies maps. Clicking back into our record for the German nautical charts, I'll select the thumbnail here and then browse this collection to open in Trove and I'll select the first sheet in the series. By clicking on this button down here, we can create a bit more space to zoom in. 
and to view the map. And you can see that you can zoom all the way in here. Something I want to point out is the Browse button up here. Uh, browse is a key navigational tool for maps. And um, you'll see the Browse button if uh, the map is part of a series, if it's double-sided, or if it's a map running over multiple sheets. So clicking on the Browse button, you can see that you get context on where a particular sheet sits in relation to others. And you've got two options here. At the moment, we're on Grid View, and here's what it looks like with List View. So moving back into the viewer, on the left, you'll see these various icons here. The third one down shows you how to cite the map. So if you were wanting to use it in a publication, you could consult this. Going back to the first icon, we see um, information and we can see a link to go back to the catalog, which I won't be doing at the moment. Some of our series mapping, so that's again, map, um, a number of map sheets covering a large area using the same coordinate system have interactive indexes. So again, clicking through to the catalog. My example this time is New Guinea, one inch. Once again, limiting to map, I hit find. So the top result's the one I want, and once again, clicking on the thumbnail to open in Trove. Here I have another option to what we saw before, which is interactive map index. So clicking on that, the gray squares indicate maps we know to have been published as part of the series, and the pink indicates maps that the National Library holds in the series. So clicking on one of the pink squares opens that map. And you'll see compared to our previous example, you have these arrows. So clicking on those arrows will take you to the next map in the direction. And clicking again on interactive index takes you back to the index. And the highlighted box is showing you the last map you're on, which I'm going to click back into. All of our online maps can be freely downloaded in high resolution by clicking on the download icon. So that's the fourth down here. And you can see that there are two different options for download. One is the compressed file, which is a JPEG. If you're wanting that file, you could just click straight on the start download button there. The other is a high resolution file, a TIFF file. Um, and this download button for that option tells you how large the file will be, which is something you might want to consider depending on the space you have available on your computer. Next, let's look at how to search for a couple of other kinds of maps. This time we'll start by consulting research guides. So on this screen, you can see a snapshot of two of our maps research guides. And there are also guides for Australian topographic maps, overseas series mapping, which we just saw an example of, and British and Irish maps for family historians. So clicking through. As you can see in the menu on the left here, um, this section on parish town and county maps is part of the guide on Australian maps for family historians. And the introduction to this guide has some background on uh, old title and Torrens title. Um, Torrens title, which came into practice in Australia in the 1860s, is what's represented on the parish and county maps held by the National Library. Under Torrens title, title information is recorded against the parcel of land itself. And you can use references on the map to trace the owners of a parcel of land to the beginning of Torrens title and to trace subsequent owners. So you can see how this is very useful for family history research. So now I'm going to take you through an example searching for parish or cadastral maps. And this search is for a place in New South Wales. So I'm going to locate the parish by using lands officer Ernest Gleeson's list of place names in New South Wales via the geographical names board of New South Wales. Here we go. So because I like wombats, I'm searching for wombat public school. Um, so now I select the U to Z list here. 
And I'll zoom in a little on that. So you see place name here. So I'm going to need to do a bit of scrolling to get down to Wombat. This gives you a sense of what Gleason's looks like. All right, almost there. Here we find Wombat. Um, so we see here the line for the public school. This tells us that the parish that's in is Wilkie. I'll zoom in a little further. The county is Harden, the land district is Young, Pastures Protection District Young, and so on. So now going back to our research guide, there's information here on what to do if you're not searching in the New South Wales ACT region. So um, namely that's to consult a list of uh, administrative divisions on Wikipedia or to consult the state-based gazetteers, that's geographical indexes or dictionaries held at the library by asking staff in the special collections reading room. Most states do have counties with the exception of South Australia and Western Australia Western Australia, which have hundreds instead. So equipped with our information from Gleason, I now once again go through to the catalogue. And now I'm going to search for Parish of Wilkie. Once again, limiting to map and hitting find. And by the way, sometimes you will have an example, a convenient example, where the place name happens to be also the name of the parish. If I wanted to see a county map, so that's covering Wilkie and other surrounding parishes, the search I'd use instead of parish of Wilkie would be county of Harden. And if there was a longer list of results here, um, I'd sort the results by title which would be um, A to Z if I was more interested in county maps and Z to A if I was more interested in the parish maps being at the top. And you'll see here, we've got one result where the map's available online and you can see here that the date of that map is 1949. So once again, clicking on the thumbnail to open in Trove. Let's just have a look at some of the features of the map. By zooming in, you'll see there's a diagram of the village of Kingsvale. There's also a diagram of the general cemetery. You see there's a list of distinctive boundaries and there are various reference notes over here. So I'm going to zoom into the village of Wombat and you'll see that our public school is here to the east and um, the general cemetery, which we saw a diagram of just above is to the west here. So again, you can see how this kind of map can be extremely useful in family history research. So let's now run through one more example using Gleason. So back to my research guide. Once again, I'll go here. And once this time um, I'm looking for Wagga Wagga Public School. So once again, the U to Z list. I'll zoom in. This time it's a bit, bit shorter scroll. Okay, there we go. So Wagga Wagga Public School. And here you can see again that the parish is North Wagga Wagga. So going back to my catalog search, um, this time I want parish of North Wagga Wagga. You can see it's already limited to map, so I'll click on find. I'm going to select the third result here to open in Trove. And once again, when we zoom in a bit, we can just look at a few features, for example, some 
land for sewage work, some land that's reserved for public recreation. And we see here a stock route that's a main road. So let's now take a look at aerial photos. So I'll click through to another guide, this one for aerial photos. As you can see here, the library has a national series of aerial imagery from 1928 to 1988, representing all Australian states and major regions to some degree, as well as series for PNG, Timor-Leste and Antarctica. The National Series Mapping was produced by the RAAF and later the Royal Australian Survey Corps and the Division of National Mapping. The photographs were taken at altitudes ranging from 5,000 feet to 25,000 feet and at scales from 1 to 6,000 to 1 to 50,000. How you search for aerial photos in the collection depends on whether you're looking for a major town or airfield, as you can see here, or smaller towns, places and sites. I'm using an example that's a major town. So opening this part of the guide, you can see there are some tips about how to search for major towns and airfields, um, mainly being to enter the place name and aerial in the search bar. So going back to the catalog. Let's go to Broome. So Broome and aerial is my search term. Aerial photos are um, drafting materials for topographic maps, so it makes sense that they're part of the map collection. I'm going to take a look at this 1949 record here. So looking at this record, we can see a list of uh, runs. So that's the units of the area covered by the flight. And you can also see a link to the online flight diagram, which I'll open now. So zooming in a little bit, if I'm, for example, interested in, you can't see it extremely well, but Beagle Bay Mission, which is here, um, I'd be looking to request um, run one, which runs along here, and um, probably the photographic range would be 5,010 to 5,015. So you can see this run one runs from 5,001 to 5,025. So another example of how you might be wanting to use aerial photography could be um, looking at it to compare Broome before and after the attack in 1942. So to request, request run one to use in the library, we'd return to this catalog record here and scroll down to the get this tab and you can see over here a button to make your request. At this point, you need to log in using details from your library card. And once you've done that, you can add comments. So in this case, that would be the particular numbers of the photo and the run you could add in the comments box. That material would then be delivered to the special collections reading room, or you could also look at it in the maps area by getting in touch with us to make an appointment. If you're not in the library and the material you want isn't yet digitised, you can order a copy through the library's Copies Direct service. I'm just going back to that record. Once again, down here in the Get This section, this time instead of in the library, order a copy, and you'll see that there's a video about the service. Once you click uh, Add to Cart, you're taken through the steps to order. And you can see the current charges on the right here. So the relevant one is that it's uh, $52 per 10 aerial photographs. And that's in the TIFF format. Above that, you'll see a note about um, copyright, um, as the library can only supply in copyright material with permission. And through the ordering process, we'll let you know if you need to seek permission and who from. So to go back to a digitised map here, if you click on the shopping cart icon here, which is just below the download icon, and click through to order now, you actually see a message that reminds you that the image is available for free download. So there's no need for you to buy a copy. 
Um, there are some short instructions here, which you'll see, um, once again, browse is very important. And if you do need a hard copy, you, you can take your downloaded file to a file print service in that case. Most of our aerial um, records for aerial photography have a flight diagram attached. So as we saw before, this one for broom. But if you do come across one without it, we can help. Just moving back to research guides, if you do need some help, you'll see that there are um, easy links here to our Ask a Librarian service, which is also easy to find from the National Library's homepage. And you'll see as well in the research guides are uh, ways to contact the map collection. I'm actually just going to navigate back to the aerial photographs guide. You can see there the contact map staff link. And um, just to point out as well that our research guides also have sections about other sources. So you can see here for this one on aerial photos um, that there are state, local and a commercial source as well to consult if the National Library doesn't have what you're looking for. So to recap what we've done so far, um, here are some search tips. Firstly, to start with a broad search term or search terms and to limit format to map. You can sort the results and limit by the various facets we saw on the right hand side. Subject headings can be very useful. And we do have our research guides and ask a librarian if you need assistance. And I think at this point we're going to pause for questions if there are some. Yes, so we have um, had a few questions asked. So um, Margaret asks, um, hopefully a simple question, which is what is a cadastral map? Oh, thank you very much for that question, Margaret. Um, that is the same as a parish map, so they're interchangeable terms. So everything that's been said so far about parish maps, that applies to cadastral maps, same thing. Yeah, great. Um, Catherine asks a question about, um, I'll, I'll read it out, in trying to establish if an explorer came to my local area, can I rely on the latitude and longitude of a map created in 1832 to be as accurate to today's GPS locations? I was told there might be a slight difference due to land mass movement over this length of time, 1832 to 2019. So I think we might in the next section touch a little bit on um, sort of overlaying historical maps with current maps. Yeah. So maybe um, we might answer that question a little bit later on. That sounds good. I hope that that's useful. Um, and we can see if any other questions emerge at that point as well. But yeah, it is quite possible that there's some variation. But hopefully, as Ruby said, by showing you an example towards the end of the overlay, um, we can see if that helps you out. Yeah, so that, um, so Catherine, if you do have a follow up question at the end, please send through another um, question and we can always clarify a bit more. Um, and Bronwyn just sent through another question. Any tips for finding places with names that no longer exist? That's a very good question. And I think that um, I probably won't be able to give you the best answer right now, but I'd like to follow that up. So I think we may be able to send you some resources to help out with that. That's a really good point because um, over time, there are lots of examples of place names changing. Excellent. So that yeah, might be something we send out tomorrow um, in, the, in the email handout. Because yeah, I think that it can be a bit of a rabbit hole depending on where you're looking and things like that. Yeah, thanks for all the questions, everyone. So now I'd like to show you some maps finding aids. And this time we're starting from Trove. So I'll click through. Um, you'll see that there's a particular zone for maps. So I'll click into that. So once here, I enter my search term, which this time is horticulturalist. And you can see here um, on the left, that table on scale, which um, we mentioned earlier in the webinar. Uh, so from here, I'm gonna show you the TCG Western map collection. So Western was an uh, officer in charge of afforestation in the early days of Canberra city being built. So just scrolling through this trove record, we can see towards the bottom, this link to the finding aid. 
And here we are in the finding aid. So in the finding aid, you can see that there's some biographical information. There's some information about how the library acquired this collection. And you can also see some um, links here. So um, links, names of people and also organisations. Having a look at this Walter Burley Griffin example, let's see what happens when we click on this link. That takes you through to other materials in Trove about Walter Burley Griffin. So this can be a useful, um, a useful thing to use. Moving back to our finding aid. Um, you'll also see that there are copies of the maps that are in this form collection, also in our general map collection. And again, clicking on the link will take you there. So if I open one of these links in a new tab and then through to Trove, we can compare this digitized copy of a map with the version in this formed collection. And from here, you can navigate back to the finding aid using the view finding aid button. So really the collection here is an insight into the person and viewing these maps together layers up our sense of their professional and sometimes personal life. And you can, um, you can see here that Weston's final resting place was a park that he had designed. So here maps are a biographical resource. Back into Trove, um, my next search example is car void range. Again, we need to go through the map zone and search. And I'm going to select the fourth result down, which is the Frank Hurley map collection. And as with Western, we can either scroll down the Trove record to find the link to the finding aid here. We can simply click on the thumbnail. And once here, I'm going to select view the full collection. And in the description of the first item here, we do see cardboard range. Let's open that up. And zooming in, you can see an annotation about cardboard range here. And moving further over here, you can see another one, cardboard range. So form collections can be really rich in terms of um, annotations. From here, I'm gonna click on browse. And that reveals that this particular map is two-sided. So if we click on the reverse, we can see a little bit of Hurley's research about hire cars. And clicking on browse again, I can navigate upwards. And that gives me a sense for this whole collection. Um, what's the sequence and what are some of the groupings? And if, you're, if you are interested in Hurley, aside from looking at the uh, formed collection, um, there's also an exhibition on here at the Treasures Gallery at the Library until the 25th of August. So you can see in this example, this example of Hurley, that um, a single form collection can contain a number of different kinds of maps within it. So in this case, we've seen some tourist mapping and scrolling down, we can see a topographic map of the Northern Territory as well. If you are interested in um, looking at the various form collections that we have created, the, sorry, the finding aids for form collections we've created, the search you can perform in the library's catalogue is MFC, which stands for Maps Formed Collections. And once again, limit to map. And you can just explore the search results there if you're interested. So finally, um, we're at the last part of the webinar, which is about um, the georectifying service that I mentioned earlier. 
Uh, so in this pilot stage, there are currently around um, 1,000 historic parish maps of the New South Wales of New South Wales ACT region. So I'll click through to the site, and you'll see that there's more information here. The search I'm going to perform to show you a warped map is um, Wagga Wagga. So I just typed that in and selected all. And here we actually have the same map we looked at earlier in Trove. So I'm going to show you what that looks like when it has been georectified. Moving over to the warped tab. So you can see that that's the historic parish map overlaid on current open street map. So you can zoom and move around and you can use this transparency bar to see more of the current mapping or more of the parish map and do a bit of comparison. So let's just look at a couple of things that we can notice. Something to look at, just zoom in a bit further is looking at what was considered uh, North Wagga Wagga in, at the time of this map in the 1940s, compared to what we see now, North Wagga Wagga down here. Also wanna make note of the Wiradjuri Reserve and Wiradjuri Walking Track. So we can see that um, earlier on, parts of that land were, um, were reserved for public recreation. Let's move further down south towards the lagoon. So what we can see here from the parish map, I'll need to just zoom in a bit further, is an um, allotments which were set aside for the public school. So you can see there six to 11. So let's have a look at uh, what's happened. And you can see that area has become Wagga Wagga Public School. Something else we can make note of is, um, sorry, just zooming out a little bit. You can see that um, this, um, main, one of these major streets, which was a stock route that um, Part of the Wiradjuri walking track actually intersects with that. So there's lots that you can do and explore um, on this website. And you can view these warped maps without signing in. And if you did want to yourself take part and georectify some maps, what you need to do is um, create an account, which you can do up here. And once you're signed up, you can um, you can also, um, besides doing the undertaking the georectification, you can also comment on particular maps. So I'd like to uh, extend the invitation to take part if you'd like to, and I'll leave the webinar there for any questions. Great, thank you so much, Susie. Um, there we go. Um, so we do have a few questions asked. Um, so Peter asks, do you have any guidance for finding Indigenous place names, for example, the islands of the northwest coast of WA? Thanks for that question, Peter. We've um, at the library been very lucky recently to have a curatorial fellow looking at um, using historic maps for um, Indigenous histories. And so I think probably the best way to help you out will be to send on some links after the webinar to give you some um, ways to search for those place names um, can be quite an undertaking. Um, thanks for the question. We'll follow up that one. Yeah, great. No, it's good to hear that there's um, lots of progress being made as well. So whatever the situation might be now, you know, hopefully in a few years, um, we have a lot more information out there. Um, Jim asks, what does 99 EU lease mean on a portion of land given to a local committee to build a hall on about 1920? So I don't believe our maps collection really touches on leaseholds and things like that. That's probably more related um, to either the state or territory that that's held. Um, so that would probably be a question um, outside of our knowledge range, I would say. 
Yeah, I think maybe um, a useful, if you're wanting to find out more information about that, um, as Ruby said, maybe some state-based authorities might be good. And I'd recommend um, in that um, research guide about parish maps, other sources, um, recommend some state libraries, for example. Great. Um, Anne asks, has a good question. Are maps listed in the state that are maps listed in the state that used to belong to? So, for example, before Queensland and New South Wales separated, are the maps New South Wales or Queensland? Oh, good question. I think in that case that with that the way the maps would be catalogued would have particular subject headings, which would include kind of um, geographic place names to indicate um, whatever the classification of that area was at the time. So, um, again, I can follow up with you, but um, there would be um, cataloguing that's quite conscious of the fact that um, it's prior to um, prior to the separation that you're talking about. That's it. And I'm sure, um, as, as Susie's saying, if you know that you're looking at a time period that is, you know, before a lot of the state and territory formations, you would just use those more historical terms as well. Exactly, yeah. So um, if you knew that, you could definitely um, include that in your search terms. That's a really good point about um, search terms, about trying to, something else that's worth doing is, I guess, um, trying a few different search terms, seeing what results you get. Um, but yeah, as Ruby said, the sort of historically pertinent search terms, that's going to be really useful. Great. Um, we had someone else who was also interested in finding areas that no longer exist. Um, and so again, I suppose actually, um, like Susie said, she will follow that up um, tomorrow with a few more resources. But I suppose it's again, connecting to search terms is um, if maps were made in a time period where those places existed, um, like um, I know, especially with the Snowy Mountain Scheme and places like that, there was a lot of locations that used to exist and were on the maps and now are no longer. You'd probably have a good chance of finding them on those maps if you knew when they, um, those towns existed. Would that's that exactly correct? right. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's a really good point about um, using um, some of the tips that we had in the webinar about um, narrowing your search. So if you know that you're after um, results within a certain time period, you can do that um, through the catalogue as we looked at. But yeah, I think again, using all the search terms that are relevant that you know of. Um, and also um, it could be a case where using subject headings, potentially geographic subject headings in catalogue records could lead you down a particular route and be helpful for your research as well. Yeah, and we'll point to this at the end of the session as well. Um, but our Ask a Librarian service, um, you're more than welcome. If you get a bit stuck on finding um, a particular location or something like that, um, this is where our maps team um, are real specialists. And so you can send through an inquiry through our Ask a Librarian and I'll show you that link at the end of the session and um, our map staff, including Susie, would answer questions like that. Exactly, yeah. Great, um, Jeff asks, um, does the library have more Queensland parish county maps than what's on the Queensland government website? So I don't know if we could say off the top of our head. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit difficult to say I'm not, um, yeah, at this point in time, I couldn't recite what's on the Queensland government website. But um, I would say it's definitely worth, it sounds like you have knowledge of what is on that website. It's definitely worth um, potentially using the same search terms you use there in the library, seeing if you get different results. Um, I'd recommend exploring and again, as Ruby said, you're very welcome to submit and ask a librarian question and we can help you out as well. Great, so we're getting a few more questions. We will, um, as we've done well for time, continue to answer them all. So <laughs> we'll keep going. Um, so Liz asks, does georectifying apply to any other parts of Australia, e.g. Victoria? Excellent, thanks for this question, Liz. Um, so as I mentioned, we are in a pilot phase of our service. So that's until about, I think, around September. Um, and so with the pilot, we started out with this region of New South Wales and the ACT, but the plan is definitely to extend it. Um, so we, we would be looking at um, definitely other parts of Australia. So um, keep an eye on it and we'll definitely be also um, promoting that as it, as it becomes bigger and, um, and inviting more people to join. So thank Great, you. and that continues on for um, Peter's question as well for maps of the entire country. So again, yes. It would be great to see um, as it leaves the pilot stage, um, more parts of the country being covered in that. Exactly. And something to mention as well is that there's some work being done at the moment to um, extend the types of mapping available on that site. So also looking at um, topographic mapping. So then you could get layers of different types of maps, which would be great. 
Excellent. Um, and Kevin asked a question, continuing on um, with the georectification, are the warped maps available for download in a format suitable for use in GIS software? Yes, they are. So we might just go back to that site. I think that I, I might not be able to show clearly now without um, logging in how that's available. But I think again, in the follow up email, we'll let you know about the particular formats. Um, but yes, I believe they are compatible. Great. All right. Um, so Manny asks, does the NLA have links to other countries map libraries? How do I connect to them? That is a good question. Uh, we, so in our research guides, for example, we, tend, we do have some links to other sources. So often that will be, for example, um, you know, within Australia state libraries. Um, in terms of um, other countries, there are definitely some um, very notable map collections. So in North America, I think uh, the David Rumsey map collection is a very large one. Some of these are actually um, private map collections. So again, perhaps the best thing to do will be to gather up some links for you and we could send them on. Yes, great. And that, um, I believe Jennifer asked, um, would it be possible to include the links you're providing to answer um, to the email to everyone? And that is the intention the whole time is um, all the links we've talked about in today's session will be sent to everyone. So don't worry about missing out on that. Um, Deborah asks, is there a property farm name index? Uh, I'm not aware of one, but um, that would probably be something that would be worth submitting as an Ask a Librarian um, inquiry and maybe um, including information about a particular region you're interested and we can see what information we have to hand. But also I'd recommend um, if you haven't already um, searching the catalogue with some, um, so perhaps something like um, parish maps could be quite useful to you potentially if you had the name of a particular region, um, you could, if you're in the New South Wales ACT region, use the Gleeson um, gazetteer basically to find the relevant parish or if not other gazetteers and that might um, help you trace some um, names of people that a particular parcel land has passed through if that's what you're after. And then you can see, um, as you saw earlier, the parish maps are really rich in information. So that could be something useful to you. But yeah, also you feel free to submit and ask a librarian. Yeah, great. And I think with some of these things as well, maps are definitely one resource for um, information like property and farm names and there would also be other information again held by um, state territory and local land councils as well yeah. so I suppose the answer isn't that there is a um, an index that has been collated for all that um, but there is definitely a lot of resources you can look at as well um, that's a really good point yeah and that's um, that reminds me that um, you know something that can some really complementary ways of researching can be something like um, searching digitised newspapers in Trove. Sometimes you, people find references that are really useful in their family history or even um, speaking to some of our earlier questions, um, trying to track down information on when a particular area was called by a certain name, when did it shift to another name. Sometimes you can combine that research um, with our map collection and indeed with other parts of the libraries and other collections and get a much better picture of what's going on. Mm, that's it. It's sort of never ending research adventures. And in addition to our maps resources, we do have a lot of other resources um, that could touch on this. We have done a webinar like today's on tracing the history of your house or other buildings. So again, um, if you were, I'd recommend that webinar if you were wanting to go down that line of um, tracking down a particular property or building. Um, so moving on, um, we've got two questions that are quite similar. Anne asks, where do you find historical maps for Western Victoria? And Margaret asks, do we have early maps for Tasmania? Um, and so I imagine that could just be done through your catalogue search examples. Exactly, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great point. So yeah, so it would just be that matter of typing in, you know, the location you wanted, even as broad as possibly. Would Western Victoria work as a search term possibly? I think you could definitely start there. And it, once again, um, you can see what, um, what results come up in terms of narrowing your search and you might find some that are really pertinent to you. So that's one way. I think try that out and um, definitely the subject headings can be a really useful one again. Great. Um, Jim asks, will aerial pics be available to download in the future? 
Ah, so good question. Uh, we do have, there are some aerial photographs that are digitised, but, but many are not. Um, and the other sources section of the research guide is quite relevant um, because if you're after really high, um, high quality, high resolution files, um, the, your best option is probably the commercial one. Um, but uh, but uh, and it can take some time for the library to provide um, the sort of quality of file you might need for the aerial photo. So it is definitely worthwhile seeing um, comparing what sources there are, what's going to best suit your needs. Um, but as there are so many other parts of the map collection we also want to digitise, um, there's not been an awful lot that's been done in terms of aerial photos. And there also is that commercial option, which I guess indicates there's another um, avenue you could go down to access them. Great. So we've got a few more questions we'll answer, but we won't, um, we might put a little line in the sand um, as we are coming up to two o'clock. Um, so I'll just um, answer a few quick ones. And if you did have any other questions, um, please remember ask librarian service and we might be able to also type an answer to some of those we don't get to today. Um, so Daniel um, just asks, what's the difference between catalogue and trove maps? I'm not quite sure if that question is um, to do with whether you start your search through the catalogue or trove or yeah different. well i suppose um i suppose one clear way of thinking of it is the catalog is our collection um so when you search um, the national library's catalog you're only searching the national library's collection where trove very much has um collections from libraries and museums from all around australia so if you were to search in trove you're going to be searching many many collections um I did make a point, um, someone asked a question that I typed a response back to earlier, is that all of our digitised collection in our catalogue, you click through to Trove. So mm -hmm. Trove actually hosts the digitised thing. So we do have that very close relationship with Trove. Um, all of our content can be found there. So hopefully that um, clarifies that for you, um, Daniel. In, in the difference is um, we, the maps that are digitised in our catalogue are available in Trove, but there's also many, many more maps in Trove. Um, all right, um, Deborah asks, are there maps for conditional purchases? I think that that would be covered by our um, historic parish maps. I believe that that's something that can show up on parish maps. So that might be something that I will double check and just let you know in the package of links that goes out what the best way is to get to that information. Um, Bronwyn asks, if I suspect a place name, um, the birthplace name is a gold digging, can I check that somewhere? So I don't quite know what you mean, Bronwyn, um, but again, um, it's always worth, um, you can just definitely try different keyword searches with maps to see whether um, you can identify locations and time periods and things like that. So hopefully that answers that for you. Um, I also got a question from Tim about overseas mapping and obtaining an early naval map of a um, Kirkot area of Iran. Um, I'd recommend sending that question in, Tim, to um, either our Ask a Librarian service, mm -hmm. um, just because um, on the off the top of our head, our collection is much more sort of Asia-Pacific area, um, but we might be able to, with a bit of research, to answer that for you. Um, and then the very last question we'll cover today is from Sally. And how would you use maps, if at all, to research about land lease ballots? So, would, again, I think that could be a question that we might not be able to answer um, off the top of our heads. I'm not entirely sure, but I think that perhaps um, a combination of the um, parish maps and sales plans could potentially be useful to you, but we can definitely follow up that one as well. That's it. So I think those more specific ones that fall a little bit outside, um, just our, you know, our simple map collection, um, definitely recommend. And so um, I'll click through. So this is our link to our Ask Librarian service as well for any questions. Um, so that's all the questions today. Thank you so much for Susie. <laughs> for her presentation um, and for answering all those questions. It's great to see you're all engaged. Um, and so we'll finish up now. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, like we've said a few times, we will be sending out an email tomorrow with lots and lots of links um, and the recording of today's session. And we'll have a survey as well um, that I hopefully trialing um, when you close this webinar, you'll um, get a link to a survey um, and that will also be available for you tomorrow.
We have our next upcoming webinar will be on newspapers and family history um, as we're entering August Family History Month. So please join that if you're interested. Um, and again, we also, um, we have um, many other webinars that we've done over the last year or so that you can view on our YouTube channel as well. So I definitely recommend. But um, thank you all for joining us. Um, we hope you enjoyed today's session um, and we'll see you next time.